everybody knows the story of the first Christmas, right? Jesus was born in Bethlehem to a virgin named Mary who is engaged to Joseph. The baby Jesus was wrapped in cloth, placed in a manger, and had visits from wise men and shepherds. There were angels, there was a special star, and there was even an evil king. And that about sums it up, right? Well, not exactly. As it turns out, the story of Jesus' birth is only mentioned in two out of our four Gospels, Matthew and Luke. Many people just assume that Matthew and Luke say basically the same thing about Jesus' birth, with just a few different details sprinkled in for good measure. But if you put Matthew's Gospel side by side with Luke's Gospel and compare Jesus' birth narratives, you will find that these two Gospels actually only have a few things in common, and they have a ton of differences. So what's going on here? Well, let's look at Matthew first. Matthew's Gospel starts out with a genealogy of Jesus' family traced through his father's lineage. And you'll notice that the genealogy is broken down into three major sections, all containing 14 generations. Matthew, in Matthew 1.17, says this, Thus there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the Babylonian exile, and 14 from the Babylonian exile to the Messiah. 14, 14, 14. Luke includes a genealogy in his gospel as well in Luke chapter 3, but Luke's genealogy looks quite a bit different from Matthew's. First of all, Luke's is a lot longer. Luke's genealogy traces Jesus' lineage all the way back to Adam, and actually it even goes all the way back to God himself. And within Luke's long genealogy, he includes the genealogy and the number of generations from Joseph to Abraham, just like Matthew does. But there's a pretty significant difference in these two genealogies. First of all, it's not separated into three chunks of 14 generations. Secondly, Matthew's genealogy tells us that the number of generations from Jesus to Abraham was 42, because 14 plus 14 plus 14 equals 42. Luke's gospel doesn't say it was 42 generations from Jesus to Abraham, but 54. And if that's not enough, the people within these two genealogies are seemingly different. For example, who is Joseph's father? Is it Heli, as Luke suggests, or is it Jacob, as Matthew suggests? Now, why would this be? This seems very strange, considering that most Bible scholars believe that Luke used Matthew's gospel to help him write his gospel. So what's the deal with the different numbers and the different names within these two genealogies? Well, there are a number of theories about why this is, and I'm not going to go into all of them in this video, but it will be sufficient to point out that Matthew has a secret meaning or secret purpose hidden within his genealogy. Now, this may be a secret for many of us today, but this was probably not a secret for most of the original hearers and readers of the Gospels. So here is the secret hidden within Matthew's genealogy. Remember the 14, 14, 14? Well, the number 14 is not insignificant, and it's certainly no accident. As it turns out, in ancient Hebrew, you can assign a numerical value to individual Hebrew letters. Kind of like if I assigned a 1 to the letter A, or 2 to the letter B, and so on. This was the case in ancient Hebrew as well. The letters within words and names could be added up, and you could get a numerical value. For an example, if I continued having A equal 1 and B equal 2, and I wanted to use my name as an example, here is what I would get. My name is Luke, so the L would be 12, the U would be 21, the K would be 11, and the E would be 5. Then I could add them up and get my name's numerical value of 49. And in ancient Hebrew, this practice had a special name. It's called Gematria. Now, in order to solve this mystery, we have to try and figure out the significance of the numerical value of 14. There are a number of different ways you can add things up to equal 14, but not all of them spell something and not all of them are significant. But there is one. Dalit, Vav, Dalit. Dalit has the value of 4. Vav has the value of 6. And Dalit, again, has 4. So 4 plus 6 plus 4 equals 14. And what does Dalit Vav Dalit spell in Hebrew? Dawid, which is the Hebrew pronunciation for the name we English speakers call David. Bingo! That's Matthew's purpose. The 14 represents King David. 
King David, of course, is the second and most mighty king of Israel, and from whose lineage the Messiah was supposed to come. That's Matthew's purpose for why he structured his genealogy the way he did. He wants to show unequivocally that Jesus is the true Messiah because he comes from the true lineage of King David. 14, 14, 14. Need more proof? Check this out. In Matthew 1.20, when the angel appears to Joseph in a dream, the angel addresses Joseph not as Joseph, son of Jacob, but Joseph, son of David. And this is just the first way that Matthew and Luke differ from one another when they talk about the events in and around Jesus' birth. But there are many more. Like, did Joseph plan to divorce Mary when he found out she was pregnant? Matthew says yes. Luke doesn't mention this detail at all. Or how about this? How did Mary and Joseph figure out they were going to give birth to the Messiah? According to Matthew, an unnamed angel appeared to Joseph explaining the situation. But in Luke, the angel, now identified as Gabriel, appeared to Mary, not Joseph. There is no mention in Luke that an angel appeared to Joseph. Matthew tells us that Joseph and Mary did not consummate the marriage until after Jesus was born. Luke, again, leaves this detail out. The next major part where these two Gospels differ has to do with the travels that Mary, Joseph, and Jesus make. Matthew simply tells us that Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea. Then we learn that because Herod wanted to kill Jesus, they fled to Egypt until Herod died. Then, when Herod died, they tried to go back to Bethlehem, but were afraid to do so because Herod's son, Herod Archelaus, was reigning in Judea. So instead, went to Nazareth in Galilee. So they went from Bethlehem to Egypt to Nazareth. Luke, however, gives us more travels, but then again, he leaves some out. Luke tells us in Luke chapter 1 that Mary, right after becoming pregnant, went from Nazareth in Galilee to the hill country of Judea to visit John the Baptist's parents, Elizabeth and Zechariah. And according to Luke 1.56, Mary stayed with them for three months, with no mention as to what Joseph was doing during this time. Then Luke tells us that when Mary was pregnant for three months, she traveled back home to Nazareth in Galilee. But in Luke, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus' travels don't stop there. In Luke chapter 2, we're told that Caesar Augustus wanted to take a census of the entire Roman world, and everyone was required to travel back to their ancestral hometown, which would have been in Judea again, in Bethlehem to be exact, because that is where King David was born. It was in Bethlehem that Mary gave birth to Jesus. Then we are told in Luke 2, 22, that Mary and Joseph took Jesus to Jerusalem for the purification rites required by the law of Moses. Then after the purification process, Jesus and his parents returned home to Nazareth and Galilee. So in Luke's gospel, we get that Mary traveled from Nazareth to the hill country of Judea, then back to Nazareth, then back to Judea, to Bethlehem, then to Jerusalem, then back to Nazareth. Interesting that there is no mention of them traveling to Egypt whatsoever. And as a matter of fact, Matthew makes it sound like Joseph and Mary's real hometown was in Bethlehem, and they only wound up in Nazareth because they were trying to escape Herod's jurisdiction. Luke, on the other hand, makes it sound like Nazareth was their hometown, and they only wound up in Bethlehem because of the census. Interestingly, Matthew doesn't mention anything about a census at all. And Luke doesn't mention anything about Herod wanting to kill all newborn babies ages two and under. These are two very different stories. Also, Matthew mentions the Magi coming from the east to see the newborn king of the Jews. The Magi are, of course, the wise men that come and bring Jesus gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Luke, however, doesn't mention the wise men at all, but instead it's shepherds tending their fields by night that come to see Jesus in the end. Luke's gospel is the only gospel that mentions Jesus being wrapped in cloth and placed in a manger. Matthew doesn't mention this at all. So with all of these differences, what do these two gospels have in common? Well, both of these gospels agree that Jesus was born to a virgin named Mary. They both agree that Mary and Joseph were engaged to be married. They both agree that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And they both agree that in the end, somehow when Jesus was young, he wound up in Nazareth in Galilee. But that's it. Everything else in these two Gospels are different. And most people don't even realize this until they line the two Gospels up and analyze them bit by bit. 
Now, I'm not saying that one gospel is right and the other is wrong, and I'm also not saying that these gospels contain contradictions. What I am saying is that no matter how you look at it, these two gospels are different, and there's different information given in and around the circumstances of Jesus' birth. So this Christmas season, when you hear the stories of Jesus' birth, don't forget to ask yourself, does this story come from Matthew, Luke, or both? I think it's time now for a bonus fact. Did you know that the distance from Nazareth to Bethlehem is roughly 95 and a half miles, and it would take you six and a half hours to travel that distance on camel? According to Luke, while Mary was pregnant, she made the trip from Nazareth to Judea twice, which means she would have traveled approximately 286 and a half miles and spent almost 19 and a half hours on the road. I don't think I would want to do that while pregnant. Mary must have been one tough lady. Stay thirsty for knowledge.